Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, so Dr. Malik, Dr. Chan, um, Dr. Frushi, um, it's so great to have you. Um, I'm going to try to just go through the questions that in for our session two that seem to be the ones that people have upvoted. And so we may be going all over the place as a uh, cleanup here. Um, and actually, this is probably an interesting question. Can a diet high in antioxidants interfere with treatments of um, effects of capecitabine? And I'll open it up to also, I get this prior to any treatment, whether it's PRT or any other treatment, will antioxidants interfere or should we be talking to our physicians about this? All right. Thank you, Josh. Uh, first of all, thank you, Lachnitz, for having me here and great to be between friends uh, and our wonderful neuroendocrine tumor community. It's a great question. Um, as far as the specific uh, interactions, whenever a patient is taking a specific over-the-counter herbal supplement or a medical food, it's really good to discuss with your provider, as well, especially your pharmacist. They're really good in knowing that key interactions because some of these things can be metabolized by the same enzyme systems and might result in lowering the effective dose of the chemo or sometimes even increasing the effective dose cause more side effects. However, uh, with regards to specific you know, herbal supplements, when we are talking about, in general, high antioxidant foods, berries or fruits, et cetera, they're usually considered very safe. So I'm, I'm uh, not worried about high oxidant foods uh, if they're just normal foods uh, and nothing exotic. For the exotic herbal supplements, please do have a discussion with your oncologist and involve your pharmacist to review if there's any interactions for the metabolism. Dr. Pushi, um, anything you want to add for PRT and, and more than just foods, uh, other supplements, whether we've seen things on uh, patient portals on doing fasts before PRT to, to try to do that. Any comments on what you advise your patients? Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me here. And I would agree with Aman. I think that the most important thing to do is to communicate with your physician, just in case. Um, I think that from a PRRT point of view, since it's such a targeted therapy that uses such a, a specific receptor, which is the somatostatin receptor, anything that relates to anything that can affect the activity or activation of that receptor, we would be concerned, or anything that could block that receptor, we would be concerned. Therefore, we are so careful with somatostatin analog injections, right? But in terms of um, foods and antioxidants, I don't think that there has been any relationship between the intake of uh, antioxidant food and any effects on PRT regarding fasting before PRT. It is known that PRT can increase the levels of sugar as the patients are going through the different cycles of PRT. But patients do not have to fast before they come to PRT in the sense that we want the patient to be energized and well prepared to go through the day. And, and it's, it's not a long day. We try to make it as, as amenable and, and easy as possible, but they do not necessarily need to, to arrive fasting for that. Yeah, I, I think this was the people who want to do like two or three day fast to make the treatment more effective. And I don't think we have any studies on that. Um, I'll move to the larger question, which seems like a simple question. Uh, what is next if PRT doesn't work? But there's, there's a loaded question that actually involves all three of you here. Let's work on the imaging um, side first, Dr. Malik. Well, um, thank you, Josh, uh, and thank you, Lachnet, for having me. Um, I'm really honored to be here, and I think most of the time, a lot of the questions that are related to imaging, like patients don't have them like answered because there's the relationship, the contact between the patients and the radiologists is somewhat like much more limited relative to the relationship with other providers. So I'm super happy I'm, I'm here and I'm able to, uh, to talk a little bit about the imaging of, of these tumors. So for the imaging of neuroendocrine tumors, typically 
neuroendocrine tumors grow slower than other tumors. So if we want to look at the change in size of the tumor, we compare to much older images relative to other tumors that progress quicker. Um, and having said that, there's also within the neuroendocrine tumor groups, um, it is a very heterogeneous group. So some diseases, uh, some type of tumors grow quicker than others as well. So we take that into consideration. We review the imaging, the anatomic imaging, which is the CT and MRI, where we look at the size change of the tumor over time. Time. And typically, this change is slower for, for NETS relative to other tumors and on a somatostatin receptor and FDG PET as well. So we take all that into consideration. And as you're saying, what if like, what is like PRRT is not working? Is the patient progressing? The disease is clearly growing while the patient is receiving PRRT. So it's, it's not helping slowing down the disease or did the disease progress actually after PRRT has been done and like several months after afterwards, the disease started progressing? again and those are like two very different like timelines of what we do about that is, is very different between the two. And Dr. Chong, given that you're doing a retreat trial and, and a bunch of other trials as well, um, retreat trial means that at some point you progress post PRT but does also mean that it may have worked for a period of time. So how do you work with that nuance of it, it worked for a while? Correct. Josh, these are interesting times that we live in. I remember the times where we didn't have, you know, access to standard of care PRT and patients used to go abroad, especially Europe, to get it. And now we have moved into an era where we are talking about post-PRRT. So these are definitely, you know, steps in the right direction. However, this is a burning question right now in our field that post-PRRT, there are essentially two categories, right? So one is what we call primary refractory disease that we do try to give PRT and it doesn't work. And sometimes we see progression during the treatment itself or immediately after. And that's essentially because either there was not enough receptor uptake. So this could have been a grade three net with moderate amount of SSTR activity. And we tried it because there was no other relevant treatment options or more importantly, biology of the cancer that it is an aggressive disease despite having smart cell receptor, uh, the intrinsic tumor mechanisms, the growth, it was just uh, pretty brisk. However, fortunately, majority of patients, they tend to have uh, secondary refractory, PRT refractory disease. That means they do have some degree of benefit. If you look into NETR1 clinical trial, more than 80% of patients had stable disease at one year, if not more. So majority of patients have some degree of benefit, if not longer, right? And that's where Josh's question comes in, and very apt question. So if a patient uh, at some point in time would have progression, what do we do in those scenarios? So those are you know, secondary PRT refractory disease. Fortunately, we do have now multiple treatment options now. Ludothera as of now is only FDA approved for four doses for progressive gap nets post SSA. However, sometimes we are able to have an off-label access, especially if patient has had tremendous response going two, three years stable disease. It's a very intuitive thing for patient. Hey doc, it worked really well for me. Can I get it again? So as long as the blood counts are good, kidney function, hepatic functions are good, and we have access to the drug, that is one of the ways to do. There are retrospective data from Europe, at least 13 studies, if not more, which shows that PRRT can be re-challenged in a lower dose, however, with safety as well as efficacy. The prospective randomized data, however, is missing, and that's where uh, we are now conducting an international multi-center study called Net Retreat, one of a unique collaboration between Canada, CCTG, and U.S. SWOG, and we're trying to address this question that is it safe to re-challenge with PRT and how effective it's in the retreatment center setting. So hopefully in the next few years, we'll be able to give you a, a better answer, but re-challenge PRT can be considered. There are some other clinical trials looking at novel PRT agents like alpha emitters, which are looking at retreatment uh, post standard of care ludothera with a PRRT, with a novel PRRT. So I do think personally that there is a role for uh, repeat PRRT as long as patient has had some response. Now, it's debatable what's considered some response. Some believe six months, at least six months post the last dose, and some believe in 12 months. With In our net retreat study, we went with more conservative 12 months. That basically tells us that patient definitely had some degree of benefit with the initial PRRT. Uh, and that's the definition we are going with. 
However, there's no unanimous consensus regarding what's considered stability after so Lutetera. Let, let me turn that to Dr. Frischi. Um What you've got, the, the raised bio um, action one opening up that's a retreatment trial, you'll probably have the net retreat trial as well. How do you advise a patient? I realize we're all different and you're going to do that based on um, the individual in front of you, but how do you look at those two opportunities um, as well? Yes. Uh, well, first, I will say that I agree with what my colleagues have said. And uh, I think that we are learning more, and, and I am hearing here that every patient at the end of the day is going to be different, and the biology is going to be different, and it will be the options um, for the patient that has a grade one may be different than the options for the patient that has grade three in the same organ. So we have to personalize the treatment. I think that that's what we are learning more and more. So important with all these options that we have will be to know if the patient uh, underwent DRT and had a very good response or if the patient didn't have a um, response at all, if the patient had very significant side effects, uh, significant toxicity, or if the patient didn't, if the patient is able to tolerate higher energies or uh, the patient already had a significant or it was hard for the uh, patient to receive uh, beta's energies. I think that those are things that will help us personalize more what is best for the patient. You did very well with PRT. Basically, you didn't have side effects. There was partial response. Maybe we will go ahead and we will add, as uh, Amanda was saying, two more cycles um, based on the uh, European data. And we will leave the possibility of an alpha meter for later on or BRT with this beta emitter was not enough for you, you recur, or your disease just stayed um, stable without any significant changes. Maybe we go to the next line of therapy that it's going to provide higher energy and higher, and hopefully higher chances of a significant response now. All right, we'll start going on the lightning round, Dr. Chauhan. You know, is it diet, stress, or treatment? And can they fluctuate back and forth? And since I have a personal history with this, I'm, I'm curious of your uh, answers. Wow, that's a loaded question. So let's unpack it a little bit. Um, so broadly, uh, neuroendocrine cancers, my previous uh, colleagues have mentioned are functional based on if they're secreting uh, the vasoactive means or they're non-functional. If they're not, usually, if you have a functional neuroendocrine tumor, you tend to retain that pattern. And if you have a non-functional neuroendocrine tumor, you tend to retain that pattern during the disease course. Now that's usual. In our world of rare diseases, we never say never. So we have all seen anecdotal cases where we have seen that one form of disease can switch gears and alter its behavior. We have even seen diseases convert from well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor to a poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas. However, those are rare exceptions. So that's where I think uh, discussion with your oncologist and, and kind of keeping an open mind whenever there are new symptoms to understand that. Uh, when I was a, a very junior uh, you know, resident, I had an opportunity to work with some of the key opinion leaders in Nets World, Dr. Eugene Waltering. So we were managing a case where an agrelinoma patient converted into an insulinoma patient, unfortunately passed away from hypoglycemia. So in our world, many things happen. We have rare manifestations. So as long as we are open to the ideas and keep an open mind, we should work based on the symptomatology. Having said that, majority of you, the viewers, please do not worry about changing the behavior characteristics unless there is a reason based on your clinical presentations or imaging modalities that we have to worry about the tumor changing its behavior. Now, regarding the second half of the questions regarding the role of diet and stress. Now, if you look into the theory part of it, the typical guidance is um, that the food's rich in amines. And what are amines? Amines are chemicals which are broken down based from amino acids by our gut bacteria. So there are certain foods which are very rich in amines, like um, anything which is highly processed or fermented or, or you know, aged cheeses, certain wines, tomatoes, and you've seen a list of the certain fruits and nuts, etc. However, in my clinical observation, not all the patients 
they tend to respond poorly to these so-called high amine foods. And many of them are able to actually uh, utilize these food products without any issues. So I uh, advise my patients, everything in moderation, as long as it's not bothering you, that's not the food product. You have to cut it off. Stress in general is not a good thing. You know, even if stress is not triggering your Carsner syndrome or other functional syndrome, stress in general is not good for your immune system, for healing. There are a lot of data from uh, just general medicines where stress has been shown to, uh, to have a negative impact on your uh, both physiology as well as, you know, mental health as well. So in general, stress is not a good thing and try to work with your friendly a healthcare provider, uh, or you can also seek specialized help from uh, Psychonk, et cetera. We have a lot of resources, but we need to have a strategy to deal with the stress. And sometimes that might mean yoga, exercise, meditation, medication, and other things. So, so although stress might not be directly linked to carcinoid syndrome worsening in all the patients, however, it's advised not to lead, uh, try not to lead a very no, stressful and, and- life. Certainly, I've been with patients who are uh, CS, carcinoid syndrome, and watching them in a medical appointment have syndrome become syndromic in front of you during the appointment certainly shows you that stress can can help bring some of these things on. Moving forward, um, I know Dr. Koontz talked about, you know, the importance of, especially with PNAP patients, getting a genetic profile. When do you consider getting a genetic profile for your children, or is it just more important to get it for um, a parent and work from there if you see anything that is in the genetic profile that uh, may be germline? So there is a rare subset of neuronic and cancer patients who develop this disease because of the familial predisposition. So these are certain mutations that are carried in the germline which makes them added risk for developing neuroendocrine tumors and certain other endocrinopathies like uh, certain uh, endocrine gland tumors, adrenal tumors, parathyroid tumors, uh, especially pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So unless there is a family history, and usually even patients have these familial neuroendocrine syndromes like MEN1 syndrome, uh, you will see a family history of neuroendocrine tumor or some of these endocrinopathies in close relatives, usually parents or grandparents. Uh, At every visit, every new patient visit, you really need to have a detailed family history of some of these disorders, which might raise the red flags. Also, these familial genetic syndromes, they usually manifest early. So uh, our typical metastatic net patients is 50 or 60 year old person. But if we are seeing a diagnosis in a relatively younger-ish patient, maybe in a teenager or early 20s, that also sometimes is a red flag and you want to go a little bit deeper into some of these familial risk factors. There are certain specific subset of neuroendocrine tumors, like, for example, pancreatic net, para and FIOS, where it is now advised that every single patient should get germline nutrition testing. But should every uh, mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor patient, thoracic neuroendocrine tumor patient, or high-grade neuroendocrine tumor patient get germline testing? Absolutely not, because almost 90% of those are what we call sporadic. It happened as a chance mutation. It's nothing that you did, or so not something that you inherited. So we get this a lot in patient land. Um, you know, this one's specific to lung nets, but how often should gallium 68 be performed? This one talks about if there's only a lung tumor that shows up and the liver meds don't, but in general, Dr. Malik, um, you know, how do you uh, talk to your oncology colleagues on when do you think certain types of imaging should be used? Is there a standard PAT answer or is this, is this really on an individual basis? Yeah, so it is really on individual basis. So when we talk about the different imaging modalities and what what advantages or disadvantages each one of them has, um, it doesn't mean that patients should have all of them done. It's really like patient dependent and it depends on the site of the disease. Um, Certain modalities are better for certain sites and how quickly the disease is progressing. Um, So basically it is appropriate to get a gallium um, or copper dotatate PET for neuroendocrine tumors at diagnosis. And then from there, we could take it on a case by case basis. So if we do see the disease well on CT, then we don't get 
uh, somatostatin receptor pet to monitor tumors. And that's what Dr. Kuhn said earlier. So typically we don't do that unless the disease is at sites that we do not see on CT um, and, and MRI. And this is typically bone disease. So if there is a lot of bone disease that we see on PET and we're not seeing on other modalities, then we get the pets more frequently to monitor that. Otherwise we don't, um, then we distance our pets because we don't want to over image. Over imaging is more harmful than helpful. So we want to avoid that. It's a hassle for patients. Sometimes they get stuck with the bill or with like even a copay that they don't without any additional value. So we don't want to do that. Um, it's important not to overdo it. So if the disease is actually, we see it well on CT and we don't need a pet for that, typically we do it every, even like two to three years, no need to do it more frequently than that. And this, this is just to check that there is no disease progressing at sites that we're not seeing on CT or MRI. You perfectly brought up a next question, which is uh, bone marrow metastases and the treatments for them. You certainly brought up the imaging frequency you know, we often get can PRT be used for bone mets, but you know, do you want to discuss PRT for bone mets and then also other systemic treatments or other directed treatments for bone mets? Yes, the systemic treatments are basically what's going to treat bone mats. And sometimes when the bone mats are painful, we do also um, recommend radiation therapy because it works quicker. So if there is a bone, bone site uh, that's painful and it's causing like it's basically affecting the quality of life radiation therapy external beam radiation can quicker just um, control the pain until other systemic treatment have had time to work um so and I, if, if I may just like add something on the net retreat, so we talked about that earlier. So the three conditions to retreat with PRRT, basically, if the disease still uh, shows somatostatin receptor expression, so we always want to do PET, make sure that it is expressing somatostatin receptor before we treat with PRRT, if the patient tolerated well earlier, and um, if they uh, actually had some kind of response to PRRT. And retreating with PRRT, we could do that clinically with lutetium dota day. So there's no need to be enrolled in a clinical trial, but for other uh, stuff, then we need to enroll in clinical trial, including the alphas in the US. Dr. Chan, what are you looking at for BOMETs in your group? Yes, thank you, Josh. Um, so one of the top three sites of metastases in well different nets is bone. So it's not a rare situation. We often incur bone metastases. Like Dr. Malak said, if it's limited volume disease, just maybe one or two spots in a particular area and is causing uh, quality of life and uh, affecting pain or issues, then external beam radiation is more than enough just to tackle those a uh, few spots. However, in reality, a lot of patients with metastatic bone metastatic disease often have a lot of smaller metastatic uh, burden throughout the axial skeleton. And, and for that, systemic form of radiation therapy, which is PRRT, works really well. In my personal experience, especially, I've seen tremendous benefit with uh, PRRT in widely uh, metastatic bone disease. Few considerations to be made. Sometimes if there is extreme uh, bone marrow involvement or bo bone tissue involvement, just be careful about cytopenias. So, so with subsequent uh, cycles of PRT, kind of keep a very close eye on blood count, especially platelets. But, but it works really well, especially for bone pain uh, and, and other quality of life issues. In these subset of patients, if there is high volume disease in the bone, there might be some benefit in uh, adding bisphosphonate. These are the medications help to strengthen the bone to prevent pathological fractures. Um, so those are two considerations, but I think PRT is a fantastic drug for a widely metas bone metastatic disease in the bone. Absolutely, I agree with every single thing my, my colleague said. And if we are talking specifically about a lot of disease in the bone marrow, like the disease is actually creating the cytopenias that the patient is having. Actually, in, in our experience, um, the benefit of PRT has gained a possible side effect of the radiation. And I think that in that case, getting rid of all the significant amount of malignant cells has been able to allow the normal bone marrow to bring the cells up. Um, so that's also a point to take into account when a patient that could be asking this question could have a significant bone marrow disease and doesn't seem to um, fit the numbers for PRT. That could be a very good uh, exception. So, Dr. Chan, one of the questions you said was actually about, you know, having your platelets and, and other tests that, that you're looking for. This 
brings us to blood markers, blood testing, and that whole round. What are the factors that in diet or others that can in, impact your tumor markers? Is there a certain time of day that someone should do their blood draw? Are there things that people should avoid for time before? And is there something that really can impact that? Great question. So the whole science of blood-based biomarker has been our Achilles heel, especially in neuroendocrine cancers. Outside functional neuroendocrine tumors where we do have very reliable blood-based biomarkers, uh, you know, for insulin, for serotonin, for majority of our non-functional patients, which are about 80% of our patient population, we don't really have good blood-based biomarker to monitor the disease. Some of our older biomarkers are fraught with very poor sensitivity and specificity in the range of 50 to 60%. So really getting these blood tests sometimes are like a flip of a coin. And then the field is moving away from general use of some of these older blood-based biomarker. Having said that, there are some new blood-based biomarkers which are very promising. For example, net test. Now, net test is a liquid biopsy test based on 51 gene assay and has been shown in few studies that it is a really excellent in terms of diagnosing, and not only diagnosing, but prognosticating certain treatments. For example, it can give you a risk assessment whether you will have relapse after surgery or whether you will respond to PRRT as well as expected. So there are these very promising novel blood-based biomarker and accessible to patients. However, uh, we are, as a community, waiting for our consensus guidelines to tell us how to incorporate these tests, when to do it, and how would they help us change the way we practice. For example, if there's high risk of relapse, does that mean we do scans every three months instead of every six months? And to answer some of those questions, I think we will have to study some of these novel blood-based biomarkers in prospective, randomized multi-center studies. And I have a happy news to share that there are a couple of NCTN studies undergoing, including net retreat, where we are going to study net test and other novel blood-based biomarker and to see if they are able to help us tweak the way we manage neuroendocrine cancer patients uh, in the prospective multicenter setting. I think you've just answered three questions in a row. Um, and I think that it's a really good point to drive home is you know, how are biomarkers evaluated? And in that sense, in a prospective trial that sees if it re really can predict change of treatment or concurrent to what we find in our imaging as well. Uh, we have a few on perigangliomas. Um, imaging for perigangliomas, what type of imaging is working there? And also what type of treatment? Because I know there's nuclear medicine treatment as well. So why don't we turn to that? Okay. Dr. Malik, what, how would you image paragangliomas? Yeah, so paragangliomas, um, if, if they're in the, like depending on the site, so um, the, the most common sites there could be like either in the head and neck and MRI works well for those. Um, if they're in the chest or abdomen CT works well and the liver MRI works well. To look for metastatic disease, we, we're gonna need a PET. We're gonna need somatostatin receptor PET. Dotatate is the best imaging modality to image uh, paraganglioma and pheochromocytoma to look for metastatic disease. Um, the other imaging modality that we used to use before having dotatate PET is MIBG scan. And there are certain tumors that actually MIBG scan works really well for, but dotatate PET, like for the overall group of pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, definitely is better than MIBG for imaging. Um, now for therapy, we could treat also with either one of these. So MIBG could be used for uh, treatment. And Dr. Aperici like, had an excellent talk on um, a treatment with radionuclide therapies. And so MIBG with uh, labeled with iodine-131 is used to treat. Um, and dotatate, which is labeled with lutetium-177, the, the PRRT. So either one of those is an option. And in patients, before we treat with radiopharmaceutical therapy, we always image with both agents because we would want to treat with 
with the agent that is going to treat the majority of the disease. So we, we image with both agents, and if we see the disease is taking up more dotatate, we go with um, uh, PRRT. If it takes up uh, MIBG well, then we might go with MIBG. And so it is on a patient basis. Um, but if we're just talking about imaging and following up for metastatic disease, dotatate PET is, is the way to go. So I'm going to close with one last question um, and one thank you guys for being here and, and joining me on this panel. Um, this has been a worldwide and it looks like we have a worldwide panel of people who are from different backgrounds from around the world. The, the question came in from Africa and it said thank you so much for the conference and, and providing this. I'm joining from Africa where there are no specialists or there are a few if you're um, in South Africa. Um, certainly reach out to LACNET's team because they're, they're, we do work with some specialists in South Africa. But um, this is in general, how do, uh, you know, and I, I know Dr. Um, Del Rivero um, will do second opinions from around the world, but how do net patients who don't have access to specialists like you um, access specialists or access best of care? I know, um, Dr. Kuntz talked about guidelines, but what's your recommendation for um, patients who don't have access to such a wonderful um, panel like uh, like what I've been working with this last 30 minutes? So thank you so much, first of all, for joining all the way from across the globe. So it, it is, uh, the ideal solution to this problem would be to raise the awareness about NATS in the local communities so that we can develop these expertise in the local community. And I think ENETS, NANETS, COMNETS, and various other organizations, ASCO in general in large, are working hard to disseminate that information, to percolate it so that we can develop the area-specific uh, expertise. I remember last year, I myself did uh, a few grand rounds in India where the fellows from all over the in India uh, listened in, tuned in, and I'm sure then uh, that would result in over the years that some of those would take up NETS as part of their area of expertise. However, in the short term, we do accept you know, requests for international consuls. For example, I recently joined University of Miami and we do take uh, international consoles, so somebody, and it's virtual. So if you if you do want to uh, seek a second opinion, and I know other centers, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, NIH, Dr. Del Rivero, and various others, they they routinely take uh, international consoles. So please feel free to reach out to us if you are looking for uh, a second opinion. The advantage of doing that is that whenever we do discuss case in our dedicated neuroendocrine cancer program, we try our best to get the images, including the sometimes biopsy samples if it's allowed for international shipping, and then review these cases in a multidisciplinary tumor board, the net, net tumor board, and try to come up with the best possible solution and game plan and work with your local oncologist. Uh, so those resources are available, but I do understand the long-term solution is to develop those specialities, specializations in your region. And both LACNETS and uh, NorCal Carcinet are members of the International Neuroendocrine Cancer Alliance, um, which uh, works with groups around the world and around the globe. Um, any final thoughts as I, before I turn it back to our studio? I, I just want to say that the, the patient advocacy groups like NorCal and LACNATS are, are great resources. And patients, like, it's it's much easier to, to reach you guys and ask questions. And, and you know you're very well connected. Um, you can you can direct patients a lot of the times to, like, um, places that would take um, international consults and second opinions. And also on the radiology end, it's been easier recently where like we could just get imaging from um, all over the place and review them. And also with our multidisciplinary neuroendocrine tumor board being virtual now, uh, it used to be in person before COVID and then we switched to virtual. And now we noticed like how helpful that is. So providers from even from outside our states, sometimes like they join our neuroendocrine tumor board and they present cases, we review the imaging together. So I think this facilitates really the communication between providers and, and it's a resource to take advantage of. Something positive that happened from the pandemic. Yeah, <laughs> and I will finish with that. I think that as a community, we should 
think about how to take more advantage of the technology to get closer around the globe. I think that the idea of faxes and phone calls, I think that they are still great and they work for some patients, but I think that we have to think as a community about how to interact faster, how to send images faster, how to uh, homogenize imaging faster between the scanners and how to stay in touch with some other colleagues and patients real time with the technology that we have. Speaking about using technology and turning things back to um, a, a different location, I'm going to take this back to the studio in Los Angeles and um, let them close with some final thoughts. And it's been such a pleasure um, talking and discussing that's with all three of you. Pleasure was all ours. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. For